So here is the portrait that I just painted. In this video, I'm gonna take you through my five steps that help me execute this painting. And before we start even thinking about paint or canvases, we have to think about what we're painting or who. So step one is taking a good photo that is dynamic and worth painting. Step two is choosing the materials and tools to help us execute and achieve this portrait. Step three, is getting that reference onto the painting surface, or in other words, a general outline. Step four is the block-in stage, which is the first layers of oil paint and the main chunk of the painting. Then there's sort of this secret optional step 4.5, but we'll talk about that later. And step five is rendering out and creating detail. So let's just dive right into this process. I love painting and sharing my process and experience. This video is sponsored by no one but myself. So I'll talk about that more in the video later. So we begin with step one, which is honestly the one step you do not have to take. There are plenty of amazing free reference photos online with portrait photography and just a simple search on the internet. I had a long photo shoot with my girlfriend here to talk about and showcase the types of photos I think look best for painting. Everything is subjective, of course, but there are elements to a portrait that I think are more visually appealing than others. An example of great lighting and what I base most of my portraiture off of is the Rembrandt lighting scheme. The face makes great shapes with the shadows and there is a clear light and dark side. The lighting is dynamic and promotes the volume of the face, making it look more dimensional. A bad example of lighting, in my opinion, is flat light where there are almost no shadows. You can paint whatever you want, of course, and you'll find in museums all sorts of portraits. This is all just my opinion again and how I like to do things. So do whatever you like to do and do whatever you think looks great, of course. And back to the photo shoot, my lighting setup in the studio may look complex because of all the gear and mess and stuff around, but the lighting scheme is actually quite simple. There's a main light source in front at about 45 degrees and a rim or hair light that's almost exactly on the other end of that 45 degrees, hitting the back of the head and shoulders. This achieves that dynamic Rembrandt lighting while also giving the subject a hairline, which is very visually appealing, I think, but also helps separate the subject from the background. I just wanted to share this photo shoot to get people excited about photography and getting your own reference of a loved one or friend. It's really not that hard to get a professional look and a great image to base a painting off of. Step two, choosing the materials to execute this painting. I am using masonite. I love masonite. It's cheap and sturdy. And we're using gesso as an acrylic binder, acrylic primer. We got a brush, a hair dryer, and this is just finessing the canvas, our painting surface. I consider this a tool for sure because this is just preparing for success, sanding in between each layer, doing about three or four layers. You could do whatever you want. This is what I do. A little trick, if you ever get some warpage, just paint on the back a little and it will suck the opposite way to make a, a little board like this flat again. I like to stain my canvas. You know, you could paint from white, but for me, I like to put a little oil paint down. I just rub some odorless mineral spirits on. It's nothing fancy, it's just to get rid of the white. It's like a little glaze, so to speak. So that's what I like to do. Again, just customizing my painting surface how I like. The paint, I use white, titanium white and brown. I don't use a black, but I generally like a limited palette. This is two yellows, two reds, two blues, basically a cool and warm of each of those primary colors. Like again, I said, I like to mix a black but also within this project for the outline, I like this willow charcoal. You could use pencil. This is just, again, all the stuff I'm using. Mediums, Gamsol, linseed oil. That's all you really need. An assortment of brushes of different types, hog hair, synthetic, sable. We use a couple Q-tips, a nice palette scraper, painter's best friend, some paper towels, really simple stuff. But the, the theory again of this step is to help think about the success of the project and what tools we need to achieve success, all preparation. The third step is the outline. How do we transfer our wonderful photo 
onto the canvas accurately, proportionally. You could use a projector. You could just be a genius and draw it perfectly. It's possible, but using a grid is the best way. I love grids, they're super easy. I'm using a two inch grid. It should be perfect for this size and it's really easy and gives you a really good result. And if you don't know what a grid is, just look it up. It's, it's quite a traditional way to transfer an image. Uh, you have to be very meticulous though, because everything needs to line up very specifically, but it's really fun in my opinion. So the trick here, of course, is to match the drawing identically to the grid we have. So you could count in one, two, three. You know, the corner of her hair starts right here. And then we're going one down and kind of through this second one or this fourth square, you know, it kind of is the upper thirds and then comes flat like this. So these marks are really not that dark and they're not super specific. We just want to frame the overall mass with key features um, onto the canvas. So I love willow charcoal. It's very finicky but it's very forgiving. A lot of artists love to do it, but you could just use a pencil if you don't want to. You can see how much it could smudge with just the, the touch of a finger, but uh, that's why it's, it's very wonderful. And that's also why you might think I'm crazy for this next step, but I'm gonna repaint the outline with the same burnt sienna that I use for the glaze. And this is just to solidify the outline. You know, you could erase with pencil or the willow charcoal, and now we're solidifying it with some oil paint just a darker, more opaque version of the Burnt Sienna. And you can see how slow I'm going here. You know, there's no rush. Uh, sometimes with time lapses, you can't see how slow meticulous you need to be. Do it right the first time. Step four is the main blocking and by far the biggest stage. We're starting to use paint here, so it's certainly the best step. This painted stage is very important and I have a lot to say about it. I really do try my best to cram as much useful information in these 15 minute videos, but if you're looking for more, I have made an almost two hour version of this painting tutorial. It is the same five steps and strategy. I just go in way more depth within each phase and try to explain every move I make. And if you like my channel, this is a great way to support me. I made this longer tutorial for beginners who just started portraiture as well as more experienced painters from the original photo shoot with lighting theory to prepping the canvas and choosing materials, gridding the painting and visualizing our painting agenda and strategy. I honestly wish I had this video when I started painting. I wanted to make this big walkthrough accessible for everyone. So it's on my website right now for only $29.99 which I think is a really fair price. That being said, I hope you can also learn a lot from this video. So let's start talking about this blocking layer. The main agenda with this painting stage, this blocking is to fill the entire canvas with oil paint. I like to work in zones to break down the complexity, but it's all about simplifying. We're not thinking about detail at all, just filling in. Still rocking here with the block in stage, really important to slowly, simply fill the entire canvas with oil paint onto the hair. I am only mixing a few values and this color of brown for the hair. I want to be maintaining this idea of simplification. So there's no point in me trying to paint this hair, every follicle, every little hue shift, some places it's more orange, there's highlights, there's you know specular highlights because hair is really reflective. My mindset is completely away from that. I'm thinking of two or three values to really just block in to frame out local values and big shapes.
We're entering the deep waters, the actual skin, the skin tones. Everyone's so afraid of skin tones. We're still in the fourth stage, the block-in. We're doing the same thing. The zone of the skin, we're gonna set up some values, simplify that, watch out for shapes, and just get paint down. It's nothing super specific. From my perspective and how I work, you have to have something down and something simple to then add detail to. So you could get so afraid in looking at these complex portraits or any photograph and be like, look at all this detail, look at all the creases, look at all these hue shifts and, and this value structure. It's like, you just gotta really simplify and go forward. Skin tones and the actual face and skin itself shouldn't be that intimidating. You just need a good technique and rubric and plan and strategy and simplifying, I think, is the first step. A common painting strategy is to paint from the darks first. We work our way from the darks to the lights, and this is exactly what I'm doing. I'm trying to find shadow shapes, and I'm trying to be simple with my shapes of shadow. But I'm doing the same thing as I did with the hair. I only mixed a few values for the skin tones so I don't get confused with a bunch of different values. My palette can stay more organized. We're just thinking of general light and general dark and filling in the face. Um, it, it's very sloppy. There's like the ugly painting stage everyone talks about. I really hardly touch this shirt. It is sort of not touched the entire painting because the focal point is the face. We're just implying the shirt. But you can see here after this stage how much darker the reference is to my painting. And I kind of knew that going into it or during the process that I wasn't getting dark enough. And I think that is a common mistake between a lot of beginners. They don't realize how dark um, reference photos are relative to their, their value structure and that you need to go way darker usually. Um, so I don't nail it first time, I was observing it and now I'm just going back in because the paint is still wet and I have that autonomy to move things around, shapes as well as value. So it is actually 1.59 a.m. right now. I painted for like nine hours. Um, I'm just like super inefficient, especially with this giant portrait bigger than I normally do. I'm also filming for the longer premium video, so it's taking like triple the amount of time to go through steps and mix paint. But I got everything where I want to. I was just fiddling all day, a beast of a painting day. I'm going to let it fully dry for like three days. Then we're gonna do some glazing and then final rendering, but uh, yeah, epic. My, my, my back hurts. Fast forward a few days and the painting is completely touch dry, ready for step four and a half, which is a glazing layer. Now, if you don't know what glazing is, that's fine. I put this step as four and a half because this is super optional. Not everyone likes to do this and not everyone likes to wait for the paintings to dry. A lot of people work wet in wet. I like glazing layers. If you don't know what glazing is, it's basically thin, transparent layers of oil to affect what you already have down. It's really fun. You could affect the values and hues really easily. If you want to learn more about it, I talk at more depth in my premium video and you could also just simply search it on Google or YouTube. I'm sure there's plenty of videos. I also use this stage and step in the painting process to affect other things like the background and the shirt, just other thin layers of oil paint. It's a fun layer and this technique works for me. So step five, we are preparing for the final stage, which is detail and render. We've gotten so far and we have planned and strategized to get to this stage. Every stage informs the next. And if we follow sort of the steps and be diligent, patient, and hold ourselves to a high standard within each step, the fifth step should just be another walk in the park. And what I mean by that is we have solidified the shapes, the features of the face, and the structure which they sit on with the value. Now in this stage, we are just adding and we are making super intentional strokes with paint. We're using less oil paint, but more intentional strokes. So I'm not moving eyes around here. I'm focusing on value, the highest highlights and the, and the darkest shadows. Um, that's important to save till the end. And I think it's awesome because the last 20% of the painting process, you know, the, the painting actually changes like 80%. You really get to see the person, in this case, Tori, my girlfriend, she really comes alive when I'm adding the highlights to the hair and that rim light. 
Um, also, those amazing highlights in the face. Uh, conversely, I'm adding these final dark points because I noticed that it's not dark enough. And so our, our peak value in the lights and our peak value in the shadows are, are being brought back at the very end, just adding amazingness, gorgeousness. Um, and this is just how I do it. These are the steps I take to uh, to paint. I leave the highest lights and the darkest shadows to the end. I think a lot of painters do. Um, you could overpaint, you can continue painting forever. Eventually you have to stop, but adding detail is, is great for the end, of course. And what a journey this was. Extremely happy with this painting and bigger than I normally paint. If I had to paint, my back would be so f And that's how I think you could really make a successful portrait. You know, there's no right way to paint. I want to make that clear. And the tutorial, uh, the two hour version really talks about, you know, this is just how it's my version. And I want to stress that uh, my process, my strategy. I think it's very similar to a lot of other painters. The general theory of working simple to more refined basic uh, values in the beginning, having a really strong drawing or underpainting to build upon and add layers. All these things are known for a while and is why, you know, this is how I paint because it helps execute the most successful portrait, but there's no one way to paint. Uh, there's no correct way. This is just how I do things. If you're interested in following along these steps, these five steps, and I wish I had sort of this video when I started out oil painting, but check out the premium version online. And I just want people to, you know, start experimenting. And, you know, this process and five stages can be broken down into only like 90 minutes. You don't have to spend a super long time on this big portrait. This was obviously like a bigger one, more rendered out, took, you know, 10 plus hours. Um, also, cause I was filming, but you know, you could do this on a smaller scale and do it more often to really um, memorize and internalize the steps and the different um, processes and strategies and different styles you want to achieve portraiture. So it's really a Mr. Potato Head mix and match strategies and techniques, and it's just familiarity and exposure. But I love portraiture and I thought this would be helpful. Again, so many people have been asking, so here it is. Um, that's all I got. I'll see you in the next video. Wowza. Finally. And also it's gonna be varnished eventually. Um, This other painting needs to be varnished. Varnishing is so fun, but we gotta wait several months. So maybe I'll make a video about that because I have like probably eight paintings in here. I need to varnish.